Snowmas. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to discuss the findings from the endometrial uh, disease working group. Um, I always love coming to Washington. Last time I was here, I walked past the government accountability office. Talk about an oxymoron. Uh, this time I was walking out of the subway and I said, well, I walk out of the metro, I saw the VRE trains. So all the doctors in the audience will know that I took an immediate right turn and went the opposite direction. So uh, endometrial cancer begins here on the lining of the uterus. It invades into the muscle of the uterus and then will spread to lymph nodes or to the omentum within the abdomen. There's two main types of endometrial cancer. There is low-grade glandular forming endometrioid cancer, which has a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and a preserved architecture. And there's a high-grade serous type, which is more solid and has much more atypical nuclei. And these are essentially two different diseases. Now, the complicating part is that it's very difficult for pathologists to differentiate these two types of tumors uh, when they are high grade. In an article in Press here, uh, where three different pathologists from three different academic centers uh, tried to uh, look at inter-observer uh, inter uh, variability. And in fact, more than a third of the cases was a major disagreement when trying to classify high grade endometrial carcinoma. Uh, type 1 cancers are endometrioid, they have a favorable outcome, and often they're treated with radiation therapy uh, when appropriate. Uh, the type 2 serous cancers, which, which are more aggressive and often metastatic, are treated with chemotherapy. So these two types have, have different treatment paradigms, which is somewhat uh, schizophrenic among the uh, um, professional community as far as you know, who gets which type of treatment. But classification is the first important step to determining uh, what treatment a patient receives. Uh, there's no mutations in endometrial cancer, P10 mutations, uh, P53 mutations, and the ones you see on this slide are, are previously known and have varying frequencies between type 1 and type 2 uh, cancers. And the outcomes are different, of course, like any other uh, cancer, early stage uh, tumors do well. And for a disease that's spread beyond the uterus, uh, the recurrence at about one year, 50% uh, of patients will recur at about one year. But interesting to note is in the advanced recurrent cases, about 25% are serous or high grade. And in the early uh, diagnostic cases, at the time of diagnosis, only about 15% of cases are serous or high grade. So when we started the TCGA project, we didn't want to collect all the tumors that were available because the ones that are commonly available are low-grade, good prognostic tumors that do not result in death. And so that would not be the best cohort to study. And so we tried to skew the accrual towards the more aggressive uh, cases that would lead to death and tried to accrue cases based on what we see in the recurrent disease setting, uh, as shown here on this slide. Uh, and we did pretty good. Uh, we've collected 373 uh, uh, cases for the data freeze. Uh, the average age uh, is about what you'd expect for endometrial cancer. Uh, we have 20% uh, of patients that have recurred. And here you can see we have about 100 cases of each, including the grade 3 high-grade endometrioid cases. And we have 50 of the serous cases. And we wanted to make sure uh, we got to 50 cases, and so we reached our our accrual goal here before doing the um, analysis. And as with uh, most endometrial cancer, there's only a few deaths. Uh, many patients will die of other causes. Um, and so we're powering most of our outcomes on recurrence rather than a death, which doesn't occur, occur as frequently in endometrial cancer. Uh, endometrial cancer being the fourth most common cancer uh, among women uh, leads to 8,000 deaths per year in the United States. Uh, to date, we have 400 and, I'm sorry, 248 uh, exome pairs, uh, just over 100 uh, low-pass whole genomes, and you can see the other numbers here uh, for the other uh, uh, platforms that have been used in this analysis, including almost 300 uh, samples on the reverse phase protein arrays. So the first thing we'll look at is a copy number, and this is just or, uh, organized uh, based on histologic subtype, and you can see that as the histology becomes more aggressive, the copy number uh, profiles become uh, more complex. Now, if you do unsupervised clustering, as Andy Cherniak did, you can find four uh, 
copy number groups here. And interestingly, the first uh, copy number group is essentially diploid with no uh, somatic copy number alterations. There's two predominantly endometrioid groups here in the middle uh, that have few copy number alterations. And then this very complex uh, group four here. And if you look at the second bar uh, below the figure, the blue here are all the serous subtype uh, cases. But mixed in here are a few other uh, lighter colors. And in fact, one quarter of the high-grade endometrioid cases cluster with the serous tumors. And we refer to these as serous-like cases. If you look at uh, progression-free survival, as you would expect, the serous group uh, does much worse. But in fact, copy number three, which is essentially defined by this 1Q uh, broad amplification, and it is endometrioid in histology, also does significantly worse than the other two, uh, two groups up here. If you look at the focalgistic peaks, again, you can see uh, copy number one right here. Um, copy number two has very few alterations. Copy number three, again, uh, cluster three has this broad one uh, Q amplicon. And then cluster four has extensive copy number alterations, like you would see in ovarian serous carcinoma, probably lung squamous, and in uh, basal-like uh, breast cancer. If you want to move to mutations, just the common mutations, just to sort of lay the landscape here, uh, P10 mutations are most common in low-grade endometrioid tumors. P53 mutations are obviously common in the high-grade serous and in a portion of the high-grade endometrioids. And just for reference, the PIK3CA mutations are essentially equally distributed across these different histologic subtypes. So now we get more into the exome data, and, and this part of the figure, I'll take a few minutes to go through it. On the top here, you're seeing uh, mutation rate, and there's a, very, there's a group of samples here that have a very high mutation rate, probably 100 times higher than, than most uh, solid tumors on the order of, of 100 per megabase or more. This group is defined here by microsatellite instability and also has a high mutation rate, and these two groups over here uh, have low mutation rates uh, and are split up uh, specifically based on copy number alterations, which you see in this row over here. This is, again, the serous cases are all over here, uh, as I'll show you later, and the uh, serous like cases are here. But um, this is how we initially divided up the um, divided up the uh, cohort, uh, again, based on mutation rate, uh, microsatellite instability, and copy number alteration. Now, moving on a little further, if we highlight this uh, subgroup over here, these 17 cases, which have very high mutation rates, are all defined by universal mutations in polymerase E, uh, which plays a role in transcription-coupled repair. And the very interesting thing we discovered um, in this a study is that 75% uh, or 13 of the 17 cases here actually have one of two hotspot mutations uh, in, in pol E, and this results in a different mutation spectrum with a significantly greater frequency of uh, transversions rather than transition uh, mutations. And so this was um, quite exciting when this was discovered. And similar findings have been seen in colorectal, in particular in the marker paper, they had a small uh, group. Um, that had this, these ultramutator cases, and since that time, they've also identified these hotspot mutations in colorectal. And this afternoon, David Wheeler um, will talk about this. If we take these um, four uh, mutation uh, spectrum groups and look at their outcome, we see, we see uh, two interesting things. As expected, again, the serous cases and the, and the high-grade uh, frequent copy number cases have a worse outcome. The two middle groups, which includes the microsatellite stable and instable uh, groups, have about the same uh, progression-free survival, keeping in mind that the follow-up data in this particular study is somewhat limited compared to other uh, studies in the literature and clinical trials. Uh, it's controversial in endometrial cancer whether patients who have microsatellite instability do better or worse. In colon cancer, it's uh, almost uniformly uh, agreed that those patients do better. Uh, and again, endometrial cancer, we see here that they do the same. And then this subgroup of pol E mutations, although it's only 17 patients, it may be hard to draw conclusions, but so far, and some of these, um, despite the access right now being in days, uh, some of these uh, sensorings do get out to three to five years. There's not a single event um, in the pol E group, so it's possible this is a good uh, prognostic subgroup and further data um, 
further study will be required, and this is underway uh, by both uh, David Wheeler and uh, collaborators. So now if we add a few other uh, rows to this figure, we can add in uh, just P10 and P53 mutations. Again, you see all of the P53 mutations are here. Virtually all the P10 mutations lie in the other groups. And now we add on histology and grade. And again, these um, purple bars are serous cases. The dark gray here are the high grade cases. And so again, these are all the serous cases plus about 25% of the high grade endometrioid cases which still are behaving like uh, serous tumors and called um, serous like. Now, you always find interesting cases here, and this is really where the molecular data can, can certainly be value added onto what you otherwise would get without ever doing this. And here, um, before getting to that, um, we'll look at some of the significantly mutated genes. There's about 50 uh, SMGs that are different, have differential frequencies between these groups. Some of the um, more attractive ones are highlighted here. Again, you can see PIK3CA mutations are fairly uh, evenly distributed. Certainly the ultra-mutator group has more mutations in every, uh, every gene. Um, ARID1A is, is not found in serous cases. KRAS is not found in serous cases. Beta-catenin is interesting here because there's a very high frequency peak among the cases that, that, that have low mutation rate. And in fact, the hypermutator microsatellite cases do not have a higher frequency, as you see in every other gene, suggesting that beta-catenin is really playing a role here in the endometrioid low-grade, uh, low-mutation rate uh, uh, cohort, and a few other genes are here. Now, getting to an interesting case here, this is a, a, a zoomed in on one part of the, of the figure, and you'll see at the bottom, this is a serous case, but in fact, it does not have a P53 mutation, there's no copy number alterations, and it has a very high mutation rate. This seemed odd, so we went into the patient portal, which you heard about yesterday uh, from the C-Bio group at MSK, and if we pull up this patient's uh, profile, you can see, in fact, there's a KRAS mutation, again, not what you'd expect in a serous case, and there's an ARID1A mutation, which is also less common in the serous cases. So then we went back to uh, the histologic section, which now, gratefully, is, is fully available for all the TCGA cases, and we had one of our uh, specialty pathologists look at this case, and he said definitively, this is an endometrioid case, not a serous case, but in fact it has some micropapillary architecture which can be uh, confusing to differentiate this from, from serous and endometrioid. And he looked at the morphology and based on some other studies he had done, suggested this case may actually have an MSH6 mutation. I did tell him that uh, it had a high uh, 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 mutation rate. And uh, Syriac uh, wa uh, from uh, Syriac, we know Syriac Candle from Wash U. Um, just last night went back to look at the uh, traces and there may be a, a MSH6 uh, insertion uh, in a homopolymer tract, so it's not clear if that's a true mutation or not. Um, but nonetheless, this is, is what would be a misclassified uh, serous case that really only could be identified from doing these types of uh, studies. We've done, uh, the Vancouver group has done uh, microRNA uh, sequencing and clustering. We found six uh, microRNA uh, subgroups in addition, methylation was done both uh, in this project on the 27 and 450K arrays. They uh, f developed some uh, approaches to integrate that data. Uh, again, like many other tumor types, there's four uh, methylation subgroups. This group here um, is a hypermethylator group that has um, uh, a simp-like phenotype that's seen in some of the other diseases. And again, here are all the serous cases that have a very low levels of DNA promoter uh, methylation. The uh, MD Anderson, uh, Wei Zhang, and uh, Yu Jin Liu have done uh, expression clustering, identifying three uh, gene expression clusters, giving them names of mitotic, hormonal, and immunoresponsive uh, based on the components and members of these clusters. The hormonal group has increased uh, expression both at the uh, gene and protein level of the hormonal receptors, and looking at the progression-free survival according to um, gene expression clusters, again, the mitotic group, which contains all the serous and serous-like cases, again, does worse, and the other two groups do about the same. Now, in this, and again, you can see that confirmed by all the P53 mutations over here and the P10 mutations over here, which really is the hallmark for differentiating these two uh, subtypes. <clears throat> 
Now, I think for the first time in TCGA, we actually took the RPPA data and used it in a supervised manner to see if we could understand and, and validate the biology from the gene expression clusters here. And doing this on this uh, uh, heat map with 36 proteins, in fact, you can see that the mitotic um, cluster has um, uh, increased expression of DNA and proliferative genes. Again, the hormonal cluster at the protein level, we see um, the hormone receptors being uh, active here. And in the immunoreactive uh, cluster, we see STAT3 as well as uh, LK, uh, LKB1, um, again, confirming uh, what we think is the proper labeling of this cluster oops, of uh, immunoreactive. And now looking at the full RPPA data, uh, courtesy of Gordon Mills, uh, they had, that was a supervised RPPA analysis. This is the unsupervised RPPA clustering. Uh, here there are five um, RPPA uh, clusters. I'll give you one uh, second to look over that slide. The first cluster in pink here has basically signaling um, on. Uh, the second cluster um, contains uh, most of the serous cases. The third cluster is basically um, signaling pathways that are off. Uh, the fourth cluster has uh, reactive uh, proteins as well as MAP kinase pathway. And the small fifth cluster, I believe, is a, a stromal signature here. <laughs> Uh, the Paradigm folks uh, did the pa Paradigm analysis uh, looking at the uh, expression and copy number uh, data. And uh, I also identified five clusters, which you can see at the bottom, but two of them are quite small. The third cluster in the middle contains all the serous and serous-like cases, which has MYC activation. And interesting here, we see the P53 pathway is suppressed uh, due to the P53 inactivating mutations. Uh, cluster five has MYC activity and hormonal activity, which is consistent with uh, certainly this disease process. And here's interesting, in cluster one, we see low mix signaling, but very high uh, wind signaling, which, will sh uh, sh which again, one confirms the uh, high-frequency beta-catenin mutations, and I'll also show you some of the specific mutations on the next um, few slides. This is the, um, speaking of the next slides, this is the, uh, from the C-Bio group, uh, I think names are on the next slide. Uh, this is the RAS beta-catenin pathway, which was the most significant uh, module that came up in their mutually exclusive uh, mutation analysis. And what we have here in these three different boxes throughout the whole figure, we have the uh, hypermutator microsatellite unstable cases, we have the microsatellite stable endometrioid cases, and the serous like cases here. The serous like cases have amplification of ERB2, which may or may not be associated with sensitivity to Herceptin. A trial uh, previously done by the gynecologic oncology group was negative using mostly immunohistochemistry. Um, the hypermutator samples have frequent KRAS mutations, and then again we see the frequent beta catenin mutations here. Now this is a different mechanism of activation in which KRAS can stabilize beta catenin as opposed to uh, APC-associated degradation, which is seen in colon cancer. And the reason that this comes up is because the beta catenin and the KRAS here are, are mutually exclusive that you see in multiple of the subgroups. Also identified were SOX17 mutations with two hotspots shown on the bottom part of the figure. Looking uh, back to one of our favorite pathways, PI3 kinase AKT, this is certainly uh, the disease where we see the most activity in the pathway. Again, the mutations are evenly distributed across the various subtypes. Uh, P10 mutations are more common, of course, in the endometrioids. And here we see mutual exclusivity between PIK3R1 and PIK3CA. This is not a new finding. It was reported about two years ago by Gordon Mills and has also been reported by others. But what's interesting here is if you look at the PIK3CA mutations, we see the common Exxon 9 and, um, excuse me, Exxon 9 and Exxon 20 hotspots, but we also see frequent mutations here in Exxon 2, which is the P85 binding domain. And then if we look at P85 or PIK3 or 1, we see many mutations with one hotspot here in the SH2 domain, which is the domain that binds over here to the, to the P85 domain of PIK3CA. And so, in fact, these mutations here are likely uh, functionally related to interactions over here with these mutations. And for that reason, you see um, almost perfect exclusivity here between um, the two genes, and I would, I would imagine th these cases are just due to the hypermutation uh, um, uh, status of these samples, and of course a few of these samples in this group do have uh, high mutation rates, but do not have microsatellite instability. Another interesting um, uh, 
finding is that there's a, there's a very high frequency in P10 of the codon 130 hotspot mutations, uh, uh, more than a third of the endometrial cases, and in other diseases that have P10 mutations, this particular hotspot is mutated at a much lower rate. Looking at PIK3CA, um, again, we went over this just in the past couple of slides, but again, this is also different than you see in other diseases, particularly breast cancer, which has a lot of PIK3CA mutations and has targeted trials going on, but the spectrum is very different than we see here in endometrial cancer, which has clear uh, implications. Uh, su uh, superclusters were done, which you've seen before. Again, this is sort of summarizing all the various platforms. There were... Um, four different uh, clusters identified. Again, the, the cluster that contained all the serous cases does worse, a common theme, of course, and the rest of the clusters show no difference in outcome uh, based on this analysis. Uh, finally, the question is whether uh, uterine serous cases share similarities with ovarian serous and basal-like breast. In the breast cancer paper, they showed similarities with, with ovarian serous as far as cyclin E amplifications, MIC amplification, and BRCA mutations, as well as correlation of expression profiles between the ovarian serous and the basal-like breast subgroup. So we asked the question, well, does uterine serous also share the features because histologically and clinically they share many features? Features. And so here is a multi-platform approach looking at copy number, again, um, expression correlations between the uh, uterine serous, ovarian serous, and basal group here. And again, now the methylation um, uh, plots are here with the uterine serous, ovary serous, and basal-like breast looking very similar. And from the paradigm group, you can see um, the consensus clustering um, here with the uh, uterine serous, basal-like breast and all the ovarian um, cases based on the uh, silhouette widths here. Uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but um, when we look at the mutations, we do find some different, the differences here. So they're very similar looking at mul multiple platforms, but when you do add in the various mutations, you see quite a few differences. Um, certainly ovarian serous and basal-like breast have, have a generally a lower mutation rate, particularly PIK3CA, uh, RB2 amplifications, PIK3R1, P10, and some of the other genes here are highly mutated in uterine serous cancer, um, which is, again, not a hypermutator uh, uh, subtype, but, but there are frequent mutations here, which you do not see in ovarian cancer, which generally has very few mutations overall, um, and you don't see them as commonly in basal-like breast. So there's many similarities. They share uh, many uh, genomic similarities, probably related to the shared uh, high frequency of p53 mutations. And some of the, uh, uh, of the um, GYN specialists and, and biologists asked the question, well, do all these cases come from the same place? Are these all tumors that begin in the fallopian tube, and some of them fall down onto the endometrium, and some of them fall out onto the ovary, giving you endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer? Uh, the mutation data would suggest that's not the case, but you easily could make the argument that they come from the same uh, original uh, site, but the microenvironment then induces them to become uh, differentiated tumors. Uh, so uh, to summarize, again, we've identified recurrent poly mutations that are associated with the altered mutation spectrum and very high mutation rate, um, very active PI3 kinase AKT pathway, which certainly has ramifications for targeted inhibition. Um, but again, one of the, the main points is that this genomic stratification can really uh, complement or supplant histologic subtyping, particularly where there's poor uh, inter-observer um, concordance, and this may have very important effects in whether a patient receives a completely different modality of treatment, radiotherapy versus chemotherapy after having a hysterectomy. And so in this era of precision medicine, these types of findings will help to design clinical trials and bring the targeted agents to the clinic in a rational manner. Uh, just a few announcements before I finish. Um, you know, TCGA is doing a lot to combat cancer. Um, I think we can do better with cigarette smoking. This is back to the Government Accountability Office where they're helping you figure out where to smoke. Uh, and in the elevators of this building, you can have a $25 fine if you actually smoke in the elevators. I think the fine should be a little higher for smoking in the elevator. Um, <laughs> The endometrial group will meet tonight at 5 o'clock in Salon 2 to discuss the manuscript and go over our punch list uh, for the manuscript. 
Uh, what else do I have? There's many people to thank. I tried to include the key players on this slide. Um, if I left you off, I'm very sorry. Elaine is the co-chair of the analysis working group with me and, and has been wonderful to work with. Uh, JJ Gao is our data wrangler. Um, and Nikki uh, Schultz has been coordinating all the figures for the manuscript. And so we're grateful to all those people. And I have 35 seconds. And so my last slide, oh, where'd my last slide go? My last slide went away. Um, let's, can I have my slides back? The last slide um, will show you that the uh, AACR is having a special conference on ovarian cancer uh, next May. And the reason I put this up is not to advertise the conference because people are studying ovarian cancer here, but they really came and said because of TCGA ovarian project, which was finished about a year or two ago, we now think it's time to have a special conference. And so now the work that's being done here is really, as you, we all know, being spread to the broader community. The subtitle should be from TCGA to clinic, but it's from concept to clinic. So if you're interested in this disease, come uh, next September to sunny Miami. And thank you for your attention. Actually, I got a quick question. So I noticed the high degree of overlap in P P10 loss and PI3 kinase mutation. P10 loss or P10 mutation and PI3 kinase mutation co-occurred. Yes, so quite frequently. Al almost I all of the P10 mutations have either pic 3 ca or, or, or pic 3 r one mutations in this cancer, but not others. Um, and when you look at the protein, there is some uh, correlations as to which. A dual mutation you have and what that functional effect is. I think basically in all these clinical trials, which you're involved with and I'm involved with, we have to basically look um, at the outcomes of the responses in light of these types of uh, commutations and see what the significance is. So does is. the RPPA data show activation of, of, of markers downstream of PI3 kinase in all these samples? Gordon has previously published that there's more um, functional activity if you have a co-occurrence of loss of P10 mm -hmm. protein with one of these as opposed to just a mutation without the loss of protein. All right. Thank you, Doug.